Last time we were talking about restriction enzymes, cutting pieces of DNA and getting them to, to ligate back together. And so now I want to officially talk about cloning. I know we've kind of introduced this topic and, and talked a little bit about it in lab. Uh, but I'm going to talk about cloning today and making libraries. So first of all, cloning. Um, cloning is when you take a piece of DNA and get it into some artificial chromosome, maybe a plasmid or some chromosome that you've manipulated, and then get a bacteria or some cell, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bacteria, but get some cell to start making that copy of the DNA you placed in there. Uh, that's what we call cloning a gene. You've got a gene from one source, you've put it into a, another source, and you get a cell to make lots of copies of that for you. Okay? So, when we take our piece and put it into this manipulated chromosome, we call that manipulated chromosome a vector. So a vector is a, some type of, uh, of DNA that we have manipulated so as to accept our piece and get replicated by the cell that you put it into. Okay. So a vector has to, number one, have an origin of replication. And it has to have an origin of replication that the cell that you're in recognizes. So if you're trying to get your piece of DNA to be made by a bacteria, then the vector you use has to have an origin of replication that the bacteria would recognize. So that when the bacteria replicates its own genome, it will replicate your vector as well, because we want this to make copies. Uh, if it doesn't have an origin of replication, you could get the DNA to be taken up into the bacteria, but it's not going to make any copies of it. And so over time, as the colony of bacteria grow and divide, your vector is going to be lost, right? So it has to have an origin of replication. Number two, you need a selectable marker because DNA is invisible. And unless the, the chromosome that you put confers some trait onto the bacteria or whatever cell that you're introducing it into, we're not going to know which cells got your vector and which ones didn't get your vector. So it has to have some type of trait that it confers to the, the new transformed cell. Now, a lot of times, this is an ampicillin gene, an ampicillin resistance allele, that allows the bacteria to grow in the presence of the antibiotic ampicillin. So if the vector has ampicillin resistance on it, then if you grow all these bacteria on a plate in the presence of ampicillin, only the bacteria that have got your vector inside of it are going to be able to survive. And so you're going to be able to screen out all of the ones that didn't take up your piece of DNA. Now, this could be other types of selectable markers. Um, it could confer the ability to you know, metabolize some amino acid or something so that you don't have to put amino acids in the, in the media that is growing in. Um, it could be some trait that actually gets expressed and you could actually see. Um, you could put some type of molecule that turns the bacteria a color, for instance. And so then you put all the bacteria on the plate. And you might have bacteria that are growing that don't have your insert or don't have your vector. But if they do have your vectors, they're turning blue, for instance. Then you could pick out just the blue ones, just some way to select for the presence of your vector in the cell. Third, it has to have a cloning site, some place to put the piece of DNA that you want to clone into the vector. Um, we talked about in our lab, we talked about the TA cloning vector. Since we did PCR, PCR leaves A overhangs. And so in the vector that we used in lab, the cloning site had T overhangs on it. So the A's and the T's base paired in, and we could actually put our piece in. Uh, that's a special type of cloning site. There are other ways you can get them in. Typically, what a cloning site looks like is, is a polylinker. And a polylinker is a region that's got a bunch of specific restriction enzyme sequences in it that aren't found anywhere else in the vector. Okay, So here's my entire vector. This is a PUC puck plasmid. Here is the origin of replication. Here's my ampicillin resistance gene. Here is the cloning site, this little pink guy here. Right here, this is a zoomed in view of that. And it's showing you there's an ECOR1 restriction enzyme recognition sequence in that polylinker right there. There's a SAC1 recognition sequence there, KPN1. There's all of these ones. These only exist in that specific sequence of the vector. So if I took this vector and did a restriction digest on it with ECOR1, 
it would cut right there and nowhere else. And so it would take this circular plasmid vector and would just linearize it. Right? So multiple cloning site has to have unique enzymes there because you wouldn't want the vector to have eco R1s all over the place because then you just fragment the entire vector and it'd be really hard to reassemble it. Okay? So the polylinker has multiple restriction enzymes because depending on what piece you want to put in, you may want to cut with eco R1 so it's got you know, the five prime overhangs that eco R1 gives. Or if you're trying to do something different, um, you know, maybe expa is the appropriate, gives the appropriate overhangs for what you want to put in. So this is a multiple cloning site. It's got multiple different ways you could open it up and linearize the piece of DNA. So questions on, a, on what a vector is? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Say it again. I guess, I, I guess I'm wondering how do we select for how the bacteria, is it the bacteria is going to cut up this? No, the bacteria is not going to cut this guy up. Um, oh. We're just, we have this piece of DNA just in a test tube, a sterile test tube of water, and all it contains is that. So we could take some of the vector out and we could do a restriction digest. We could put in whatever restriction enzyme we want. So if you wanted to cut with eco R1, you would take your solution of DNA, put it in a tube, put the eco R1 enzyme in with it, incubate it, and that eco R1 is going to cut your vector just right there. Then we would purify away the eco R1, have just the DNA, it would just be a linearized piece of the, of the vector now, and then you would cut your insert with eco R1, put the two of them together, and they'll, they'll go together. So, we select for where we want it to be cut by what enzyme we selectively expose it to. Right. OK, so to actually clone your gene then, I've got my, my vector. We've lost the origin of replication. It's just not shown here, but it has to have it. My ampicillin gene. Here's my, my polylinker. So to actually clone the gene, what I'd have to do is open up the vector by cutting it with a restriction enzyme. And I would have to prep my fragments, my pieces of DNA that I want to actually insert in here. I would need to prep them somehow in an appropriate way so that the overhangs that the fragment has would actually match up with the overhangs by the way I opened up my, my vector. Right. So if I just cut both things with the same restriction enzyme, then the overhang should be the same, and they should be able to base pair together and go back. Isn't yeah. That kind of what we're doing? Yeah, we did this in ours, right? Except ours was just really simple. Our PCR fragments had A overhangs. The, when we bought the vector from our company, they had already opened it up, and there were T overhangs on it. And so the A's on our PCR hooked up with the T's in the vector, and so our piece got put in there. And where yours are at right now is we added DNA ligase. And the DNA ligase then reforms the phosphodiester bonds between those, the, the inserted piece and the vector, and we recircularize, make a complete circular piece of DNA. Closed our vector up. Now, sometimes the vector will go back together. Right? If you put DNA ligase in a cut vector, then the vector could just it's got the appropriate overhangs. It could just snap back together, and you could actually go back this way. Uh, there's often little tricks that they do. Um, they'll like remove phosphate groups off of the, um, of the last nucleotides. And if they don't have those phosphate groups, then ligase can't put them back together. And so only an insert that has the appropriate phosphate groups still on that three prime end would make sure that only fragments get to be sewn together by the ligase. Um, so there's little tricks to make sure. So usually, um, if you buy a vector that's already open from a company, they have probably already treated it that way. So that's very, very um, seldom that it would actually re-ligate to itself. Um, if you just bought a piece of DNA, though, and you cut this open yourself, you would have to then treat with another enzyme that would clip off those phosphate groups. And then you would soak it with your fragments 
so that your fragments are the ones that provide the phosphate group to, to re-ligate. So there'd be one additional step if you opened the vector up yourself. All right, this, there's a second, uh, you can do multiple levels of screening for these. Um, we're actually gonna do a second level of screening in our products, and so I'm gonna tell you about that right now. Um, let's, actually, let's go back here. Um, in this multiple cloning site right here, in this plasmid, there's another gene, so in light blue, it's kind of hard to see, but in light blue here is a gene called LAC-Z, and it produces an enzyme called beta-galactosidase. Basically what it is, is it's the enzyme that cuts up lactose into glucose and galactose. So the sugar lactose is a disaccharide, it's a glucose molecule and a galactose molecule put together, and that is lactose, right? This enzyme cuts those in half, and just gives you the free glucose and the free galactose, okay? So we've put that enzyme, the gene for that enzyme right here, and very cleverly, uh, companies have manipulated that gene so that it contains those restriction sites. So right in here, there is a sequence, it contains all these restriction sites, and so they've manipulated the sequence so that they're there, but it continues to be a functional, the entire thing is a functional LAC-Z gene that just happens to contain those convenient sites in it, okay? So every time you open up this vector, what you do is you break apart that functional LAC-Z gene. And if you actually get a successful ligation in there, so here's that LAC-Z gene in blue, or light blue, here is our multiple cloning region of that LAC-Z gene in pink. If you actually put your PCR product or your piece in there, what you've done is just created a huge, massive insertion mutation in this gene. And that gene is no longer gonna be functional. So it's no longer gonna be able to cleave lactose into glucose and galactose. It's just gonna ignore lactose, okay? So what you can do then is use this as a screening method, right? Uh, any any bacteria that has taken up this vector, one that has a successful insert in it, right? It hasn't gone back together on itself. If it goes back together on itself, it has a functional LAC-Z gene. If you've got an insert in there, you've created this mutation. Well, when I actually get this piece of DNA to be taken up by a bacteria, so you stress the bacteria in the presence of the DNA uh, that we've ligated, the bacteria will suck it up and then we actually plate the bacteria, we put the bacteria on an auger plate, and on this auger plate contains ampicillin, so bacteria that have taken up a vector are the only ones that can grow, but they might have taken up one that went back, the vector went back onto itself, or the vector is actually containing our insert. We can't tell the difference between those if we just grow them in the presence of, of ampicillin, because both of those would successfully grow. They both have a functional ampicillin resistance gene. But then we throw an additional thing on this plate. We throw this molecule called XGAL on it. What XGAL is, it's a lactose cognate. It's a molecule, in fact, I think it has, yeah, it has a galactose molecule. But instead of a glucose molecule, it's got something that looks like glucose. Um, but when it's freed from the galactose, it turns blue, okay? So it, it's not really a lactose molecule, it's called XGAL, but the LAC-Z protein, if, you make, if this is a functional gene, if that LAC-Z would actually make its functional gene, it would recognize XGAL and it would cleave the galactose from this other molecule. And if you cleave it, that organic molecule on its own turns blue, okay? Now if I've disrupted that gene, it's not functional, it's going to completely ignore the XGAL, and the XGAL remains colorless, okay? So I take out all of my bacteria, I put them, you know, spread them out on this plate, and the blue colonies indicate bacteria that have taken up the vector, but the vector had just closed on itself, right? And it's making a functional LAC-Z gene 
and it's turning all of this excal, it's breaking up the galactose and the organic part of the excal and turning blue. The white colonies here are ones where they've taken up a vector, but the vector has your insert in it. They're not making the functional enzyme, and so they're completely ignoring the excal, and it's staying colorless, and so the colony remains white. This is called blue-white screening. Because now if I go in, I could just selectively pick only the white colonies. I know those ones must have taken up an insert. And I could screen out all of the other ones that took up a vector, but one that didn't contain actually my piece of DNA. Questions on this? Does this make sense? Yeah? Does this only work with beta Um you know, I imagine that somebody else has other mechanisms to do this, to screen for an insert. Uh, this is the most common one. Um, Xgal is cheap. It's not that expensive to do. Um, so this is, this is the common one. Now, it only works if you put Xgal on the plate, right? If you don't put Xgal on the plate, it doesn't matter if you're making a functional enzyme or not. They're all just going to look white, right? Right. The not no, I mean, the excal is all over this plate, okay. right? And so that's, those bacteria, there's plenty of excal around. They just don't have the enzyme to break it, so it stays white. Now, if they had the enzyme to break it, it would break in two, and then the thing would turn blue. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, usually you pour the auger plate, and then you spread Axgal on the top of the plate, and then you put your bacteria on the top of the plate, so after you pour it, yeah. Yeah? So the Axgal was ignored because it was broken up when the bacteria was placed in the gut? Yeah, so only a functional lax Z gene is going to be able to break it apart. Okay. But if you've stuck your big piece of DNA in there, you've caused this massive mutation. That enzyme's not going to work anymore, and so it can't break it stays white. All right. Let's talk about multiple types of vectors. Right now, we've just been talking about plasmid vectors, just vectors that are fairly small. They can contain small pieces of a DNA, and they are replicated by bacteria. They've got bacteria origins of replication. Bacteria normally recognize plasmids. They happily replicate them in the cell. Um, So vectors are relatively small in size, but this actually varies quite a bit. So I'm going to talk about what, you, what happens when you want a bigger piece of DNA. Uh, a bacterial plasmid is only a certain size. You, you can't make a bacterial plasmid over, let's see. Some of them you can put in an insert of up to about 10 kb, 10,000 base pairs of insert. And then the vector itself is going to be somewhere between 2 and 4 kilobases. So a vector really can't get much bigger than about 14,000 base pairs. If it gets over 14,000 base pairs, basically the bacteria just won't grow if it has it in it. It just recognizes like, this plasmid's way too big. I'm wasting too much time replicating this plasmid, and so it will ignore it. And that, ba and that, um, that bacteria basically grows really slow, if at all. Okay. So a bacterial plasmid, a bacterial vector like this, is only going to get you inserts from about 100 base pairs. You know, you could put a really tiny little PCR product of 100 base pairs. Up to about 10 kb is, is kind of the upper end. That's if you want to do it in a plasmid. Now, you could also, though, make what are called BACs, or bacterial artificial chromosomes. Uh, if you make a, a vector that is made off of the actual bacteria's genome, you can, like, take a bacterial genome, basically strip away almost all of the bacteria's genes, and just use this artificial chromosome as your vector. Now, since it's a chromosome, it's got, all, it's got traits that the bacteria recognize, and so when the bacteria replicates it, it thinks it's replicating its own genome. So it will tolerate bigger pieces. So in a bacterial artificial chromosome, you could go up to 350,000 base pairs 
you would stick that in this bacteria artificial chromosome. So instead of us having just this tiny little circular vector, you've got a really large vector that the bacteria thinks is its genome. So you can stick big things in there, 150 to 350 KB worth of, of, um, of your DNA that you want the bacteria to replicate. You have to transform the bacteria and get them to take this up, but once they do, they think it's their genome, so they'll make it for you. So these are called bacterial artificial chromosomes. You can also make viral vectors. This would be an artificial viral genome that you've manipulated to take in your, uh, your piece of DNA. Um, there's clever ones called phage mids. Um, so you could make just a viral vector that would just be replicated by a virus and it always has to be packaged by a virus. So you're always having to perpetuate the virus in some host cell, right? So you would get the virus to take up this vector the virus would then have to infect a host cell and then hijack the host cell, make lots of copies of its genome and your viral vector, repackage itself into the virus, and then you could infect. So you always have to be, if you're using a virus, you always have to package it in a viral coat and then have a host vector or host, um, host cell type. Um, what people have done is actually combined a bacterial plasmid and a viral genome so what happens in a phage mid is where you have two origins of replication. Basically, it's a bacterial plasmid. So it's got a bacterial origin of replication. You know, you could put whatever selective genes you want on it, multiple cloning sites, do whatever you like. But then you also put a, what's called an F1 origin of replication. That is a viral origin of replication. So this could exist either as a bacteria plasmid, and the bacteria will recognize the origin of replication and think it's a plasmid, or you could infect with a virus, and then the virus thinks that that's its genome. The virus replicates it, packages it into its genome, packages it into its protein coat, bursts open the bacterial cell, and then you could go infect other bacteria with it. And then the virus is gonna inject this phage mid and then the bacteria that just got infected are gonna think they just got a bacterial plasmid and they'll continue to replicate it. And if you want it to go more, then you infect it with another virus. So this virus that's perpetuating it is called a helper virus or a helper phage. So you can always just keep it as a plasmid, just replicate it, just grow bacteria if you want. Or if you wanna get it into a new strain of bacteria, you could infect with this helper phage. The helper phage think that the that phage mid is its, its genome, it'll replicate the phage mid, package it, and then you could go infect another bacterial strain with the virus. So you can alternate between a viral phase and a bacterial phase with a phage mid. Um, there are certain specific types of phage mids. One's called a cosmid. It's just got these cos sites that encourage, replic or, uh, encourage uh, the, uh, the lysogenic phase. So those cost sites like encourage your, your uh, vector to recombine with a bacterial genome. So you could actually try and make a transgenic bacteria with a cosmid. Um, these take relatively small fragments here, um, 20 to 50, you could get up to 50 KB in a cosmid. Yeah? When you like, get a bacteria with a virus, is that mm -hmm. a lysogenic cycle? Can it be a bit Depends on what type of virus you use. If you use a retrovirus, then you could get it to go lysogenic, and it would try and integrate its genome into the host. Uh, if you're using a, back, a virus that just goes through the lytic phase, then it's just going to infect, and it's just basically going to kill the cells mm -hmm, until, you, until you wash all the virus away and just go you know, save the bacteria. Right? Yeah, but if it's a lytic phase, then the bacteria won't replicate the, the vector, and then there's going to be Yeah, the bacteria get hijacked. If you, if you use a phage mid and you get a helper phage in there with it, then the helper phage is gonna infect the bacteria and the bacteria is gonna get hijacked and it's no longer gonna replicate the plasmids anymore. You're now relying on the virus to replicate your, your, your vector, package it, and then you can get all the phage and reinfect a new bacterial strain. If you want to go into the bacterial phase, well, you infect and then quickly wash away all the phage and then just get the surviving bacteria 
that should have retained, now you'd have to select for it, right? You make sure that there's a selectable marker. So you infect with your phage, it should stick your vector in there. You quickly wash away the phage and plate your bacteria on a selective thing so that you only culture the bacteria that got infected and have your, your vector with them, right? So in this process, um, like researchers, do they choose specific bacteria that they know will um, enter mm -hmm. the isogenic phase? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So depending on what you want to do, you just pick whatever phage you want, pick the vector that's appropriate for what you want. So you have to do a lot of forethought into thinking about what, what do I want to do with this? How do I want to propagate it? What size is it? What am I going to do with it? So, yeah? Is that the same factor that bacteria use to exchange positives? Uh, yeah, I mean, on a phage mid, you could, you could put an F factor on there. And so you could then get your your plasmid to be transferred from bacteria to bacteria because there's an F factor on it, right? So you could either, you know, you can manipulate these vectors any way you want. If you just want it to be contained in a single bacteria, then don't put an F factor. If you want the bacteria to be able to exchange your vector, you can put an F factor and the appropriate genes on that, and it will make a pillus and transfer your, your vector back and forth between bacteria. So. All right, last class is yeast. Basically, when you're designing a vector and you're, you're trying to clone a gene, you're going to be trying to use a, an organism that replicates very quickly and makes lots of copies. So bacteria is great, right? You can grow vats and vats of bacteria, and they'd all contain your vector if you got it in there. Uh, viruses, if you, uh, however much bacteria you have, you could infect those with as many viruses as you want. They're going to propagate really quickly. The other thing is uh, yeast. Uh, yeast grow very quickly. You can grow those in big vats as well. The additional good thing about yeast is yeast is a eukaryote, right? Um, if you are cloning your gene because you want the bacteria to make a protein, for instance, um, if you're trying to make a human protein, bacteria often have a hard time making human proteins because bacteria don't have Golgi, right? Bacteria don't have ER. Bacteria don't have all the enzymes that do lots of these post-translational modifications, manipulations to the protein that your human cells would do. Right? So you can have bacteria make very simple human genes, genes that don't need to be extensively modified. But if you're trying to make a human gene or a mouse gene or a fly gene that normally gets processed in the Golgi and gets modified and gets cleaved and gets folded properly, bacteria is probably not going to do it for you. So if what you're trying to do is clone your gene so that you can get your vector, get your model organism to make a protein, well, you might have to go into yeast, right? Because a yeast is at least a eukaryote, right? It's got ER, it's got a Golgi. Um, it's, it can do these modifications for you. Now, yeast might only get you so far as well, right? It might be something that, say, you know, multicellular animal needs to do. So sometimes you actually make vectors to infect insect cells and grow insect cells in culture. Sometimes, if it's a really specific human protein that only humans make, you might actually have to design a vector that gets taken up by a human cell culture and grow this thing and have human cell culture make your human protein. Uh, human cells grow pretty slow. They're finicky. They often get contaminated with bacteria and yeast because those grow better. Um, so that's hard to do. If yeast will get you the protein you want, then do it in yeast. right? The other advantage is yeast have big, long chromosomes. Right? Bacteria and viruses have very small genomes. Yeast has a fairly large genome. So a yeast vectors, and these are yeast artificial chromosomes, can take up much bigger pieces of DNA. So if what you're trying to do is clone a big portion of chromosome one of human, well then probably you're going to want to have to go into a yeast. So yeast artificial chromosomes um, can take from 200 kilobases, so 200,000 bases, to up to 2 million base pairs. You could get a 2 million base pair fragment of a human chromosome, clone it into one of these artificial yeast chromosomes, and then when you transfect it, when you get that piece of DNA into the yeast, the yeast will think, oh, that's just one of my chromosomes. And every time it replicates, it's going to make another copy of that vector for you. So yeast artificial chromosomes are called yaks. Bax and yaks, right? <laughs> Bacterial artificial chromosomes and yeast artificial chromosomes.
Um, yeast have linear chromosomes. So this brings in some new things we've got to make sure our vector has. If you're working in a bacteria or a virus, you can have a circular genome and you don't have to do, do much. Linear chromosomes require that you have to have, number one, you have to have telomeres. Because if a yeast gets a piece of DNA that doesn't have telomeres on it, it will think it's an invading something or other and will just get digested away. So you've got to put telomeres, and you need to put telomeres that are the yeast-specific telomere sequence so that it recognizes it as its own chromosome. Right? So in addition to having an origin of replication, having a selectable marker, you also, in a yeast chromosome, are going to have to have telomeres. If the yeast are going to replicate this and go through the cell cycle, it's going to have to have centromeres because that's what's going to need to be hooked up to the spindle so that it can separate these chromosomes. So yeast are going to have to have telomeres and a centromere. It'll have then a multiple cloning site. So here's a polylinker restriction sites for cloning. And it's, you're going to have in yeast you're not only going to have to have one selectable marker, you're going to have to have two selectable markers. Because think about trying to clone into a yeast vector. You're going to cut here in your multiple cloning site. Now, in a bacteria, you had a circular chromosome. So when you cut in the multiple cloning site, it just became linear. And then when you put your piece in, you recircularized it, right? Well, here, I've got two telomeric arms. When I cut that to get my insert in, I've now generated these two fragments floating around. And to re recreate the vector, I need to get my insert flanked on both sides by the two chromosomal arms. Right? So I have to have a selectable marker, and that's this guy, ARS, or T TRIP1. Uh, this is, makes the, um, the yeast of, uh, able to make their own tryptophan. This is, uh, I think this is a, um, allows the yeast to grow in the presence of a, a, like an antibiotic kind of molecule, a yeast-killing molecule. So what I need to do is select to make sure that I got the appropriate left arm by, by this selectable marker, and then I need to be able to select to make sure that my insert that I got in there has its proper right arm by, by some other selectable marker. So if you're doing yeast culture, you always have to have two screening things going on at the same time. Now, you might be doing even four screening things, or you, know, you could be doing a lot, but you need to have at least two to make sure that you got the appropriate left arm and the appropriate right arm. Okay. It got eerily quiet when <laughs> <laughs> it seemed really loud, and now it seems really quiet. All right. Does this make, does this make sense? Questions about yeast chromosomes? All right, I'm going to talk about a couple of cloning tricks, and then we'll talk about libraries. Um, if you've got a PCR product, you've got A overhangs, so it's really easy to clone in. You could just do a T overhang cloning, right? If the piece of, of DNA that you're trying to get into your vector, you cut with restriction enzymes, well, then I've got the overhangs, if it's a sticky-ended um, thing. I just cut my vector with the same enzyme. If it's got the polylinker, it's got that restriction site in the polylinker. So it's easy to get ones together if they've got the appropriate overhangs. Um, problems arise if you have to cut your piece of DNA with certain restriction enzymes, but the vectors that are available don't have that same restriction sequence in their polylinker. Right? What if you can't get the sticky ends to match up? Uh, you can do a couple of tricks to actually get these things to go together. So the first trick is, um, if I'm trying to get into a vector and I've got the wrong, um, the wrong sticky ends, what you could do is just chew away the sticky ends and make, your in, make the thing that you're trying to clone just have blunt ends on it. Okay? So that's what I've done here. I've got some piece that I want to clone in and for whatever reason, I didn't have the appropriate sites that I wanted there. So you can add, um, you can add exonucleases. There are certain exonucleases that will just chew away the free nucleotides. So you can change a sticky-ended thing. So either have a five prime overhang or a three prime overhang. You could just throw in an enzyme, and it will just chew away any of the bases that don't have a match. Right? They chew away single-stranded 
pieces of DNA, but they'll leave the double-stranded region, right? So I've just chewed away anything that was inappropriate on the sides. Then you could open up your vector with something that you something that's specific, right? Here, this is uh, what is this? G G A T C C. Oh, that's Bam H one. Okay. So I've opened up my vector. My vector has uh, C T A G overhangs, right? So what I'm going to do is make my blunt-ended piece of thing that I want to insert have the appropriate restriction enzyme that I want. What you could do is you just make little synthetic pieces of DNA that have the restriction site that you want on it. Okay? So first thing you do, you take your double-stranded piece that you want to clone, you take a linker sequence. This is just a short little thing that you can have synthesized by an organic chemistry lab. Right? You just send away a sequence and you say, I want you to make short little pieces of DNA that have a BAM H1 sequence in them. And then you just throw all of those together in a tube. You know, your, your insert that you want, the little linkers, you throw in DNA ligase, and it's just going to blunt end everything together. Now, you're going to get wacky products out of this. Right? Uh, you're going to get sometimes two of your inserts sticking together. right? Because if you took one of these guys and another one, they've got blunt ends. T4 is just going to ligate things together. There's no sequence specificity here saying what's going to go together. So sometimes you'll get you know, your pieces getting you know, kind of polymerized together. Sometimes you'll get your piece. Hopefully what you want is at some point you'll get one linker, your piece, and then another linker stuck on the other side. If you get at least that, then what you can do is then do a restriction digest. Right? So even if there was additional crap you know, multiple things on the other side here, multiple things on the other side here. As long as what you get is your piece flanked by two linkers, you're good to go. Because what you can do now is just do a restriction digest on this. Right? You do a restriction digest with BAM H1. BAM H1 is going to come in and recognize that linker. It's going to cut away anything that was on that side. Right? And it's going to cut here, and it's going to cut any way, everything away on that side. And as long as there isn't a BAM1 site somewhere in your sequence, then what you'll have done is created BAM sticky ends. And now you can just do a ligation traditionally. Right? You've got overhangs that match the overhangs in your vector. And boom, you get it right in. So this is called ligating linkers. You could also do a similar thing <clears throat> if I wanted to, to clone a PCR product. You could actually incorporate in your PCR primers a little restriction linker on the end of them. So you could get your PCR primers to have specific sequence to sit down and amplify the thing that you want. But in addition to the specific sequence that sits down and amplifies, you could put little primer sequences or little restriction enzyme linkers on the end. So then when your PCR product goes, you've incorporated those linker sequences on the end. Then you just do a restriction digest on your PCR product, and now you've got the appropriate sticky ends on the end of your PCR product. And then you could just clone those into whatever you want. So there's lots of vectors available, and they've got lots of different restriction sites. So if you want one in, in particular, you just go through all the catalogs of all these companies and pick the appropriate one. If one doesn't exist, then you might just have to do one of these tricks and modify your insert to fit whatever the current vectors are that are out there. Right? So. Well, you cut with the enzyme, and they're all going to be there, right? And so you're just going to do a ligation, and all kinds of random things are going to go into your vector as well. But then you'll just screen for the appropriate vector. So you'll grow up a bunch of bacteria, and they might have you know, a nice, clean piece here, or they might have gotten a lot of random other things. But you can just grow up these and select for the ones that you want, right? So. These are probably going to be the most common things in there, um, because they're the smallest. Usually, the smallest things are the ones that go in the most frequent. Uh, but you, you'd have to go through and screen, make sure you, you got the one that you want. So you have to isolate DNA from all the bacteria that you're growing up, cut them with BAM H1. And if they come out with the size piece that you wanted, then you know that's the one you've got. If you grow up a piece of bacteria, 
isolate all the plasmid DNA and do the restriction enzyme, and it's got a bunch of other junk in there, you know, it's this huge piece of DNA that you don't want, well, you just throw that colony away. You know, just screen through, the, find the one that you want. Yeah. So basically, you just do some restriction mapping on the products. The restriction map that matches the type of insert that you want, that's the one you choose. All right. We'll just introduce the idea of a library. A library is a bunch of bacterial colonies that all contain a different piece of DNA fragment. And I'll talk first about a genomic library. You can make a genomic library, you could make a, or an mRNA library, um, there's a bunch of different things that you could clone in. A genomic library would be this. Here's a piece of genomic DNA, this long pink thing. And here is uh, all the places where this enzyme, SOW3, cuts. Okay? So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sites that have this sequence. SOW3 recognizes GATC. That's palindromic because the reverse complement would be GATC, reading the opposite way. SOW3 always cuts between the G and whatever nucleotide was previous to it and it always cuts after the C, okay? So here in this piece, this is where SOW3 will cut. To make a genomic library, what you do is you do what's called a partial digest. Um, up to this point, what I've been saying when you do a restriction digest is you take your, your thing that you want to cut, you put in with the restriction enzyme, and you leave it at 37 degrees for you know, an hour, two hours, and a complete digest is when you give the SOW3 enzyme the ability to go and cut at every single site, right? So in your test tube, you're gonna have your DNA, and it's gonna have you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of copies of the piece of DNA that you want. You put your enzyme in there, and you give it enough time so that basically every piece of DNA in there gets cut at every possible site that SOW3 recogni recognizes. Right. That's a complete digest. It means every single one of your pieces of DNA got cut at every place that it could be cut. What a partial digest is, is you do the same thing, except instead of incubating it for a couple of hours, you just incubate it for a couple of minutes. And then you immediately put it into a solution that kills the enzyme's activity. What's going to happen in that case, in a partial digest, is one piece of DNA in there might only have gotten cut right here and right here. The SOW3 just didn't have time to go and find these other sites, and so that piece of DNA only got cut at those two sites, and so I've generated this little fragment, and I've generated this huge big fragment, okay? Now another piece of DNA in your sample, the SOW2, or the SOW3, may have cut here, and missed that one, didn't have time to find that one, but it cut here and it cut here. So another fragment is this slightly bigger piece and the rest. A third fragment may have only got cut here and here, leaving this other spot. So every single piece only got partially cut, and it got partially cut at random places. What that's going to mean is that you've randomly fragmented this genome with overlapping regions. So this piece is not going to overlap anything, right? But if this piece was next to this piece, right, I've got that entire portion overlapping itself, right? So I've kind of, in a sense, got some redundancy, some duplication here, right? Uh, what you would do in a genomic library is you take all of these random fragments that you have and you would clone all of them, right? They're all cut with SOW3, so they've got GATC overhangs. Well, you clone all of these pieces into plasmids that have an appropriate overhang. So what I've got in my tube now is I took all of this DNA and I soaked it with all these plasmids. Now what I've got is hundreds of thousands of plasmids, and they all contain a slightly different piece of this original thing, right? Now if what I do is 
take those plasmids and get a bunch of different bacteria to, to take them up. If I take all those bacteria and now grow them on a plate, every single little colony there is a bacteria that's growing a slightly different fragment of that entire piece of DNA. Right? So what I've got is hundreds, thousands maybe, of, of bacteria. And if I were to go pick them out and sequence their pieces of DNA, they all have these slightly overlapping regions to them. What I've done is created a genomic library. Because now in all of these bacterial strains, I have the, the entire sequence. But I don't just have one big sequence. I've got all little fragments. This is how the genome, the human genome, was actually sequenced. What, what uh, labs did is they isolated certain chromosomes. They took little pieces of the chromosomes. And they did partial digests of them and created all of these tiny fragments in all of these plasmids. And then they sent all those pieces out to all these different labs. So one lab will be sequencing, and they'll sequence this big piece. And another lab sequenced this piece. And then because they have these overlapping sequences, we know that those were adjacent pieces on the chromosome. So you do all these tiny little sequencing reactions. And because of the genomic library, you can put them all back together and recreate what that original big sequence was. Because this is a huge sequence, right? It could be hundreds of thousands of bases. And you can't just sequence that, right? You have to sequence in smaller chunks. So, so for the human, human genome, you wouldn't use a yak. You would use like well, a yeah, they actually did use yaks. Yeah. Well, they, used, they did a first pass, and they fragmented the genome in really big pieces and put those all in yaks. And then they took each individual yak and then fragmented that in even smaller ones and put them all in plasmids. So they sequenced all the plasmids, put them together, decided what the yak was, and then sequenced the ends of the yaks and put all those back together. So it's a multi-step process because, yeah, it was huge. But you're right. They went through a yak first for all the big pieces, and then they sequenced all the individual yaks by subcloning them all into bacterial plasmids. So, yeah. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.